Well, let's see if I can circumlocute. That's a fancy way of saying talk around a few things in a circuitous manner, right? Circle around some things and see if I can join them together somehow. Uh, I want to talk about the nature of technology, the cyberpunk dystopia that we're in, um, how things have changed a lot since the 1960s and 1970s with the sort of peace love, um, the free love, the holding hands around the world, the hippie movement, the hippie dippy movement, the beatnik movement. Um, at the time, I guess in the 60s and maybe even in the 70s, they had a well, there was a group of people who would have had a positive vision for the future. Maybe they would have said, listen, our stuffed shirt grandfathers and prim and proper grandmothers or mothers um, didn't hand a world to us that we want to live in. We want to create a bright new future where it's always sunny <laughs> in Philadelphia or elsewhere. And... I think that they thought that if they just assumed that everybody in the world was good, was honourable, had good intentions, just needed to be shown love, that they would in turn show love back, that whatever generosity they showed other people in the world, it would be reciprocated, and that the problems in the world had always been because people weren't allowed to have fun and smile um, and just be happy. And the problem is, is that breeds irresponsibility and it's also a self-delusion. It allows people to descend into a comfortable feeling that um, allows them to think that they don't have to work hard, fortify the walls of their civilization and of their own hearts and minds. People become lazy, both physically intellectually, mentally, emotionally, and things start to unravel, as we see, you know, because you cannot, <laughs> it turns out, uh, lie in the sunshine all day, because work does need to be done. Uh, society and civilization and standards <laughs> require work to maintain. So what I want to do is harken back to a book which was recommended to me by a lecturer in university who taught how to program computers. And I didn't agree with everything that he said pretty much. And the first thing that he said to us on day one was, could everybody please who has ever had any previous experience with programming, please put their hands up. And of course, I and most of the other people in the lecture hall put up our hands very proudly and you know wave them high probably even like school we try to put our hands even higher by raising our elbow with the other hand something like that because we wanted to show oh i'm good i'm learned i'm knowledgeable i'm a good boy you probably don't have and i thought you know i was going to say you probably don't have to teach us very much because we know it all already <laughs> you see you don't know at every age we have no clue what we don't know you know we've no idea what we don't know we don't know what we don't know and we're so clueless about that and we look on others and we think that those people are stupid. You know, we look at, on, uh, you know, we think we're so intelligent and we look, and I'm not trying to do a humble brag, but, you know, we look on others and I won't be any, I won't be specific about what others I'm referring to, but we look on others and we look down on them and we think, oh, those people are so silly and they have no idea of the rarefied air, uh, which we breathe up here in these high echelons of higher learning, you know, <laughs> or, or better self-knowledge or, um, more sophisticated civilization, um, and we think that they, you know, engage in just uh, hapless and helpless monkey see, monkey do type of existences uh, where they just mimic what they are shown and um, what they see on screen. <laughs> you know, so I am obviously going to try and bring this around to sort of show like, you know, how little did we know? But, you know, I'll speak collectively and individually and take personal responsibility for my actions or inactions in this whole grand comedy tragedy. So this book that was recommended anyway, it was called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And... Um, it was by a fellow called Robert M. Piersig. And uh, I thought Zen, 
you know, it's something to do with, you know, hippy dippy type crap, like, you know, when you kind of go, um, like this, you know, <laughs> and you just feel your inner chakras and you become wiser through, you know, smoking a doobie and uh, looking out uh, over a great vista from a high promontory somewhere, you know, in the Himalayas. And I just thought, well, listen, I don't need to know any of that claptrap. I'm here to study computer programming. I've learned 95% of it and I just need to be taught the last 5% of it. Gosh, <laughs> darn it and tarnation. And uh, because the, the response, by the way, to the response that we had all collectively given to his question about uh, how many people have had programming experience before, he, uh, he said, well, that's disappointing. I'm going to have to uh, basically teach you how to forget everything you know already. You're going to have to unlearn whatever you know. And I thought, how dare he? He doesn't even know what I know. He has no, I, no clue about what I, how good I could be, how competent I might be already. You know, I've read all the, the books of, uh, well, when I say books, I mean like sort of programming manuals. I've looked through all the user guides and there's just a few perhaps undocumented things that I haven't figured out how to do in my cleverness, <laughs> you know. Um, so that felt like a real punch in the gut. And I thought how unfair of him to do that on the first day, you know, to make me so crestfallen. Because I thought I was going to be <laughs> somebody who would go there, impress everybody. And they would say, my gosh, we haven't had a student as promising as you in many decades. <laughs> Why has nobody noticed your brilliance before? You know, and I would say, yes, I agree. It's so unfair that I've gone unrecognized for so long. Um, motorcycle maintenance as well. I thought, oh, motorcycle maintenance. I probably thought, I don't have a motorbike. They're dangerous machines with oil and chains and primitive you know, I, I don't see how programming these sophisticated computers with my clean hands on clickety-clackety keyboards could possibly have anything to do with fixing or oiling a chain on a motorcycle. And I said to myself, maybe he's going to try and tell us that there's a relationship between fixing engines and building software. And I thought, look, that's, I get abstract concepts. I understand abstract concepts. I don't need to have that explained to me. And I don't want to have to read a whole book just to understand that concept. So I didn't read it on his recommendation. It was a sort of, it wasn't required reading, it was recommended. And I thought as well, well, if it's not required, and I probably was still thinking about to pass this course and to earn my certification. If it's not required reading, well, then why should I read it? See, and it's taken probably two decades to realise the folly of that kind of thinking. Like, if I don't have to do something, then why should I? I bet you there's a lot of people out there listening to me right now who understand full well as well uh, how uh, short-sighted, um, how arrogant it is to think that if something isn't required to earn a seal of approval, a certification uh, or a passing mark in anything, that it would be unnecessary then. If something is not obligatory, <laughs> that we wouldn't have to do it then. I wouldn't need to do it. And maybe we, we should not be so presumptive. <laughs> I certainly shouldn't have been, you know, because this book is magnificent. And maybe I read it. Um, I think I probably found it on the Internet. I call it the early Internet, <laughs> you know, um, maybe when I was in my mid 20s. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I should have read this before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then it was only recently that I went back to have a look at it again because, hey, you know, the cyberpunk uh, techno bizarro world we're living in now <laughs> is very, very relevant to this book. Um, And I want to quote you a few pieces from it. OK, it's from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And bear in mind, I think that this was written in the late 60s or early 1970s. And this fellow, maybe I should give you a little bit of a biography. Um, he was a lecturer in a university and I forget exactly where, but I'm going to guess it was in Washington state, but maybe not. Um, but he did a motorcycle journey from, if not the Pacific Northwest, um, yeah, maybe he might've started out in Michigan, but anyway, somewhere up North and he, the intention anyway, was to go on a motorcycle journey with 
um, a neighbour of his, his friend and his friend's wife and also his son. And that it would be a good experience, the four of them, it would be a, um, a way to connect with his son in a way that maybe only fathers can sometimes connect with their sons when they go to a football game, perhaps, or maybe if they actually together work on repairing an engine or build, it's build some kind of project together, you know? You know, the way that you have to have a framework within which to connect to other people, especially people who you should have a genetic connection to, but maybe you don't have much in common with otherwise, you know? And the journey unfolds and unwinds both metaphorically and physically as he makes a journey down uh, through, I don't know, Montana, Idaho. Um, I, yes, I would say Wyoming. And I think, you know, the idea is to get to California eventually. And, you know, I think also, you know, that you're going to have some hardship going through some of these places, like supposing like the, the high plains where there's no tree line and maybe you're going through Colorado and you maybe go up quite high and... It's going to get quite cold, but you know that eventually when you get to California, there's going to be, you know, maybe you're going to get to sea level. You're going to go to somewhere nice like Venice Beach. Maybe not exactly right now, but, you know, somewhere on a lovely coastline. Um, I remember I was invited to go to a place called, I think it might have been called Dolphin Bay. And, I, and it was by this couple. <laughs> I was in Las Vegas. OK, quick deviation. And um I thought to myself, I was sitting at a gambling table with them, you know, it was just, I think it was during the day and I was only just passing the time and we were shooting the breeze and uh, they said, oh, you must come up and visit us, you know, you can stay with us. And I thought, well, you've only known me five minutes, well, maybe 15. And I thought, uh, this is probably like one of those bizarro, <laughs> uh, you know, cult things. I would preface it with something else, but, <laughs> you know, well, like that thing that somebody I think recently got prosecuted for and they were tattooing people and I thought, <laughs> yeah, I've heard of this. You wake up with your kidney uh, missing and you're in an ice bath and there's a note saying, here, listen, uh, thanks for the good time. <laughs> uh, there is a phone and you can call yourself some emergency services. So uh, I often wonder what would have happened if I would have taken them up on their offer. But anyway, uh, he figures the journey is going to end uh, in a place that is a reward basically for hardship that teaches you something about life. You see, you don't learn much while you're lying on a beach <laughs> in California um, with the pleasant waves crashing on the shore and every time you get too hot, you just take a bit of a dip into the water and then you come out and you uh, <laughs> you sort of like shake the salt water off your, uh, your flowing mane as you come out of the water and uh, you know, you sort of maybe pat your nice pectorals, you know? <laughs> and you wonder, are there any ladies looking at you? <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of slightly exaggerating. But anyway, let me get back to this book. Um, maybe the other, bi I kind of should say in his biography, he was a lecturer, but he went insane. And I think the whole journey about the book is, you know, that he had some kind of nervous breakdown where he maybe even forgot um, parts of his life or anything before his life, you know, and he was trying to reconnect with his memories of who he was and <laughs> funnily enough at middle age I can identify with that I sometimes he described how he had memories of his past but it was like looking back at old film reels of somebody else who wasn't him and boy I can understand that when I go delving into my mind for memories of when I was in my 30s my 20s and my teens but anyway um this fellow was always looking into what what it is to understand the nature of having your life and what does it mean and, and a key word was quality right? I better say that quality so quality of life what is it exactly I mean so that's a theme that runs through the whole book you could it could pretty much have been um, subtitled the search for quality through the American dream something like that Okay, so here we go. Wow, that was some preamble, but I think it was necessary and it probably doesn't even cover everything. And boy, would I like to hear some people give some, not just feedback, but more so contributions to their understanding of this book or their understanding of America and Americana. You know, the way that the idea of America is packaged as something and, and as a commodity. And is that 
Like, does it denigrate the idea of being an American or a nation of America? And are there some good aspects to it? You know, a meme, right? It doesn't sound like a very good thing, but an idea that's carried forward like a flame that's passed on like the Olympic torch from mind to mind over the generations. Well, that sounds more grand, doesn't it? All right. I think maybe that's suitably uh, or a suitable uplift uh, on which to begin reading this very erudite but yet accessible and down-to-earth work. They talk once in a while, in as few pained words as possible, about it or it all. As in the sentence, there is just no escape from it. And I asked, from what? The answer might be, the whole thing or, you know, the whole organised bit or even the system. Sylvia once said defensively, well, you know how to cope with it. Which puffed me up so much at the time I was embarrassed to ask what it was and so remained somewhat puzzled. I thought it was something more mysterious than technology but now I see that the it was mainly if not entirely technology but that doesn't sound quite right either. The it is a kind of a force that gives rise to technology. Something undefined but inhuman, mechanical, lifeless, a blind monster a death force. Something hideous that they are running from, but no, they can never escape. I'm putting it way too heavily here, but in a less emphatic and less defined way, this is what it is. Uh, somewhere there are people who understand it and run it. But those are technologists and they speak an inhuman language, which when describing what they do, it's all parts and relationships of unheard things that never make any sense no matter how often you hear about them and their things their monster keeps eating up land and polluting their air and lakes and there's no way to strike back at it hardly any way to escape it that attitude is not hard to come by you know, you go through a heavy industrial area of a large city and there it all is, the technology in front of it are high barbed wire fences, locked gates, signs saying no trespassing. And beyond, through sooty air, you see ugly, strange shapes of metal and brick whose purpose is unknown and whose masters you will never see. What it's for, you don't know, and why it's there, there's no one to tell you, so all you can feel is alienated, estranged, as though you didn't belong there. Who owns and understands this doesn't want you around? All this technology has somehow made you a stranger in your own land. Its very shape and appearance and mysteriousness say, get out. You know there's an explanation for all this somewhere. And what it's doing undoubtedly serves mankind in some indirect way, but that isn't what you're seeing. What you see is the no trespassing, keep out signs, and not anything serving people, but little people like ants, serving these strange, incomprehensible shapes. And you think, even if I were a part of this, even if I were not a stranger, I would be just another ant, serving the shapes. So the final feeling is hostile. And I think that's ultimately what's involved with this otherwise unexplainable attitude of John and Sylvia. Anything to do with valves and shafts and wrenches is a part of that dehumanised world and they would rather not think about it. They don't want to get into it. And if this is so, they are not alone. There's no question that they have been following their natural feelings in this and not trying to imitate anyone, but many others are also following their natural feelings and many people are similar on this matter. So that when you look at them collectively, as journalists do, you get the illusion of a mass movement, an anti-technological mass movement an entire political, anti-technological left emerging, looming up from apparently nowhere, saying, 
Stop the technology. Have it somewhere else. Don't have it here. It's still restrained by a thin web of logic that points out that without the factories, there are no jobs or standard of living. But there are human forces stronger than logic. There always have been. And if they become strong enough in their hatred of technology, that web can break. Clichés and stereotypes such as beatnik or hippie have been invented for these anti-technologists. The anti-system people, and will continue to be. But one does not convert individuals into mass people with the simple coining of a mass term. John and Sylvia are not mass people, and neither are most of the others going their way. It's against being a mass person that they seem to be revolting, and they seem to be revolting. And they feel that technology has got a lot to do with the forces that are trying to turn them into mass people, and they don't like it. And so far, it's still mostly a passive resistance. Flights into the rural areas when they are possible. And things like that. But it doesn't always have to be this passive. I hope you can see some parallels there. I'm not going to point them out. But uh, boy, is this relevant to our contemporary experience. Okay, one last paragraph for you. And I'll leave it at that. I disagree with them about cycle maintenance, but not because I am out of sympathy with their feelings about technology. I just think that their flight from and hatred of technology is self-defeating. The Buddha, the Godhead, resides quite as comfortably in the circuits of a digital computer or the gears of a cycle transmission as he does at the top of a mountain or in the petals of a flower. And to think otherwise is to demean the Buddha, which is to demean oneself. So, is that not perhaps the most poignant and relevant thing that you've heard today? Uh, that you can immediately see the parallels to our contemporary predicament. Um, I think because I had such a long preamble, I won't pontificate anymore and point out the obvious to you and insult your intelligences by saying, hey, do you see how this aligns with this? Okay, <laughs> I'll credit you with enough intelligence to see the things which I see only now as being so obvious. Now, I'm not going to say that, say, 20 years ago, I didn't see the obvious parallels, parallels, but I guess it's like, you know, is it Bette Midler or somebody like that who sang, no, God, it wasn't Bette Midler, it was Joni Mitchell, right? It's very appropriate, I think, to invoke this little tune in your heads. I've looked at love or I've looked at life from both sides now. And... um so it's not that I didn't understand at all back when I was 20-something. But I didn't have, I feel, like as full or as rounded an understanding as I do now. <laughs> now, I've made the mistake in the past of thinking, aha, now I understand this. Or, ah, well, now, of course, that I have become enlightened and know everything. Um, I can see how foolish I was in the past. At least I was self-aware enough when I was, say, in my 30s to sort of say, oh, oh, be careful now. If I suddenly start thinking that I know it all now, just because I am me at this moment, <laughs> well, am not I just setting myself up for further embarrassment down the line when I'm, if I ever get there, 50 or 60 or 70 or 80? <laughs> or should I live as long as to be 100, which I doubt, but who knows? I would like to see if I could have egg on my face back then, even if it is just drooling down because uh, I happen to be a nice, uh, in a nice place where somebody who genuinely does love me is looking after me and just, you know, feeding me scrambled egg by a, a spoon. <laughs> I'm not able to chew so well anymore. Anyway, um, I should never make the mistake of thinking that I know it all. 
because you can be sure five, 10, 15 years later, if I live so long, I'll be looking back and saying, my God, how naive I was.